So good afternoon. Uh-uh, come on. It's a long day. We've all been here. Let's loosen up a little bit. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, so when I was thinking about how to introduce this topic, I came up with all kinds of different phrases, the first being that it was a microcosm of all neuroethics issues. That's not actually accurate. What it is, I'll spare you the other list, is it's sort of the quinta, come on up, panel. I'm not going to talk long. Beauty contest. Hmm? Like Senator, like a beauty contest. Jim? Jane? Hank? Come up and I'll introduce you, but I was going to introduce. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. So, as Barbara said, this is a, a panel focusing on mental health disorders in prison, neuroethical and societal issues, and it really is the quintessential neuroethics topic. And we have this afternoon sort of quintessential neuroethics experts to comment on it, so don't feel any pressure. So if you think about this issue, it's probably among the most complex neuroethics issues you can contemplate. It's a clinical and mental health policy issue. It's a criminal justice issue. It's a human rights issue. And um, on top of that, we put all that together, it becomes a neuroethics issue of the highest order. It's got all kinds of components, and I don't want to preempt anything that the panel might say, but I just I made a little list of things. So issues of accountability for one's acts if one has a brain disorder. So that's a neuroethical component. The issue of whether we're using prison for punishment or for treatment. The issue of whether treatment in prison ought to be voluntary or it doesn't matter whether it's voluntary. Can we impose treatment? An issue of whether the crime was committed because the individual was mentally ill or whether the individual expressed mental illness as a consequence of being imprisoned. Stigma is obvious. Um, and then you get the societal set of issues which relate to whether ideology common beliefs, intuition, stupidity, trump science as the basis for how we as a society approach this issue. I'm sure everyone who lives in the United States is fully aware that this issue uh, is so prominent in America's prisons, it's often said that the LA County Jail is the largest mental hospital in the world. It's not clear, some of the other jails are pretty big. <laughs> but the, the uh, prevalence of mental illness in the criminal justice population is absolutely tremendous. One of the reasons it's so important for a group like us is that these tough, complex neuroethics issues don't get addressed nearly to the extent they need to and I hope by the end of this panel discussion, maybe we'll have some ideas, not only of what makes this interesting and provocative, but what one might actually do about it and how you might deal with that intersection of criminal justice and mental health, mental illness, uh, from a societal point of view. So we have, as I implied, a terrific panel uh, to deal with the issue. James Blair is chief of the unit on affective cognitive neuroscience at the National Institute of Mental Health. I'm not going to go through everybody's credentials, but let me say he's impressive as hell. 
Jim Giordano has more titles than any living person, but I'll give you a few. He is professor in the departments of neurology and biochemistry at Georgetown University, chief of the neuroethics studies program of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics, co-director of the O'Neill Pellegrino Program for Brain Science and Global Health Law and Policy at Georgetown University Medical Center. He has some other affiliations as well. And you've met Hank Greeley, uh, who I think we all know well, who is a professor of law at Stanford University, one of the most distinguished neuroethicists certainly in the United States and probably in the world. So this is a really good panel and I hope they don't screw it up and make <laughs> it boring. <laughs> so the way we're gonna work it is I have now officially introduced them. They each will speak for 15 minutes. If they go over, I will stand up and make very rude sounds. <laughs> um, so don't feel any pressure about that either. Hank knows me well and knows I'm capable of it. Mm. Um, That's when he's being good. <laughs> yeah. After that, we'll open it to the floor, and when we do that, I'll give you the famous definition of what a question is. <laughs> With that, <laughs> Dr. Uh, thanks very much for being here, and hopefully my slides are about to appear. Yes, good. Uh, and I take it I press the green button to advance them. Now, I should say that currently I am a government employee and I am not able to say anything resembling an opinion about um, what should happen. I can only tell you a little bit about the science. If I tell you about um, uh, anything that looks like a policy idea, I'm in all sorts of trouble. So if a, and a policy idea creeps out at any point during now, well, probably unlikely in the talk, but in the questions, mm -hmm. I didn't say it, or if I did, I said it definitely not as a government employee. So I'm just, I even took off my government label here just in case I slipped up. So, uh, so there we go, because otherwise I'd be doing a bad thing. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about the mechanisms that particularly put the person at risk for antisocial behavior that you see in a lot of individuals, um, um, at least a set number of individuals in jail. So the, um, my basic plan is to very briefly talk about RDOC, which is this new way of thinking about psychiatric disorders. I'll very briefly mention a little bit of the difference between reactive and instrumental aggression. And then I'm going to concentrate on um, mechanisms that, when dysfunctional, increase the risk for antisocial behavior. And giving a very formalized definition of what um, a specific empathic process is, talking about acute threat response, talking a tiny bit about reinforcement uh, based decision making. I won't be talking about response control just because otherwise I'll have rude noises done in my ear, so I'm, I'm just keeping it short. And it's only going to be a little taster of all these things, just so you see some of the, the data that is available that hopefully is going to be getting us to the issue, which is in brackets at the bottom because we do not have great data, which is with respect to treatment. And what I'm really going to be stressing is treatment not of psychiatric conditions, but treatment of mechanisms that go, that have got, that when they go wrong, put the individual at profound risk for problematic behavior. So, now I do want to make sure to say one thing. Um, um, uh, neuroscience has a very little to say about a large, small proportion of antisocial individuals. The reason why I say large, small is because we don't exactly know how many that is. And in fact, that's going to be massively dependent on the population that we're looking at and the circumstances that we're looking at. One thing I do want to make sure I say now, and I'll be repeating at the end, um, the fact is there's nothing about antisocial behavior that makes it a neuroscience-related problem or about necessarily dysfunctional mechanisms. If I told you that this little device here was worth $100 million, if there's anybody in the room that wouldn't want to try and steal this device, that person is a neuroscience-related issue. I mean, there's something wrong with your decision-making if you're not going to try and steal it. It's $100 million, you can buy the, neuroscience, uh, the Neuroethics Society, another one tomorrow, and you're walking off with $100 million. It will be a really, really dumb bit of decision making not to go and steal it. So just to show you that, you know, the fact is that antisocial choices are not necessarily the indication of anything problematic. They may be the best choice in the individual circumstances at that time. And so one of the reasons why I say, you know, we, we don't know the proportion, because as things change in a society, the um, uh, advantages, disadvantages, and social behavior change, and so we'll get different levels of proportions um, in there. 
But I am going to be talking about mechanisms that, when they are dysfunction, do put the individual at risk. And I'm putting in the context of this RDOC. Um, this is a, a, a uh, position that's being pushed heavily by Tom Insel at the NIMH. And really, it's to go away from the sort of standard diagnostic approach of saying this person has disorder X, this person has disorder Y, based around clusters of behavioral symptoms, and instead to concentrate on mechanisms, in neurocognitive mechanisms, that, where, that, um, that when they're dysfunctional, give rise to specific symptom sets. Now, it may be that several of these mechanisms cluster together and give rise to clusters of symptom sets. And so that's where we get these diagnoses coming from. But that's not to say that everybody with schizophrenia, for example, has system X, Y, and Z dysfunctional, or everybody with an um, a antisocial personality disorder has A and B dysfunctional. And in fact, it may be that A, system A, can be dysfunctional in this individual with antisocial behavior, uh, antisocial personality disorder, as well as that patient with schizophrenia. So we can see mechanisms that can be dysfunctional in individuals across psychiatric pa uh, pathologies, but giving rise to similar symptom sets. And that's the whole basis of this RDOC approach. Just very frank, but just to give you again, just to illustrate this business about these, you know, we can see an, an outcome, which is antisocial behavior, somebody hitting another in individual, but very <coughs> different ways that that can be, uh, the origins can be very, very different. We can get this sort of frustration or threat-induced reactive aggression. Somebody's frightened, somebody's frustrated, they lash out and punch somebody. Versus an instrumental antisocial action. Somebody punching out somebody else in order to achieve their, their, their gain their money or gain, their, um, gain some other aspect. Whole bunch of conditions that put the individual at increased risk for reactive aggression, whole bunch of psychiatric conditions. Um, uh, uh, there's really not very many, in fact, there's only really one psychiatric condition that puts the individual at increased risk for instrumental aggression going out and actually harming another individual to achieve their goals. And that's this disorder of psychopathy, which again, I'm not going to be able to go into any detail, but just to phrase that, we see very different psychopathologies putting the individual at rather different um, uh, risks for different types of um, problematic behavior. So we're going to move straight on to the mechanism. As I said, it's going to be a relatively fast-paced uh, talk just to give you a flavor of where we are with the, with the research. So. With respect to, um, uh, we know that there are imp important mechanisms that allow the individual to respond to the distress of other individuals, and this means that not only are they more likely to shut down their ongoing behavior, so they're less likely to continue an action that harms other individuals, but very importantly, when they're watching other individuals distressed, they learn that actions that harm that other individual are bad. They might still want to do them if the reward is strong enough, but the fact is, is that they learn that the action hitting another individual is a bad thing to do. Why is it a bad thing to do? It hurts the other individual. They get, you get learn to have an emotional, um, aversive response to just the idea of harming another individual because of pairings of the representation of that thought with the distress of the other individual um, in front of you. The amygdala is this little region um, colored in there critical for this type of stimulus reinforcement learning. And we see a group of individuals out there who show profound problems. These individuals with psychopathic traits, callous on emotional traits, reduced guilt, reduced empathy, these individuals fail to show this ramping up in an amygdala response to the distress of other individuals. The more frightened that face is, if you look across to the right-hand side, the greater your amygdala will show a response unless you happen to have this condition, in which case you won't show that ramping up. Now, that's just uh, graphically in the bottom illustrating that. I should want, just want to stress up, it's an extremely robust lab. We, we picked it up uh, originally, but there's um, uh, English labs, other American labs. It's, uh, it's been a very nicely well-replicated result. Um, uh, now, what's particularly nice is one of the more recent studies showing, in line with predictions, that the more you have problems in showing an amygdala-based reaction to the distress of other individuals, the greater the risk you are for instrumental antisocial behavior. In other words, if you aren't bothered by the distress of other individuals, 
you are much more able to do actions that harm other individuals in order to meet your goals. I mean, it's not terribly surprising, but it's nice to see it being documented. So we see a specific relationship between a form of dysfunction responding to the distress of other individuals and a consequence, which is the ability to do actions that harm other individuals in order to achieve your aims. Now, the other thing I want to note here is that we see this problem in across psychiatric conditions, not in every individual with schizophrenia, not even with most individuals with schizophrenia, not in every individual with autism. In fact, it's pretty rare in individuals with autism. But if you find an individual with schizophrenia, or if you find an individual with autism who is showing some um, heightened levels of instrumental aggression, those individuals are likely to show these types of impairments. And the extent of impairment they show is likely to go together with the extent of problem the individual's having. So that was the first mechanism. This system allows you to respond to the distress of other individuals. We also know very clearly there's a very basic threat response. The amygdala down into hypothalamus, down into periaqueductal gray. The more that mechanism is stimulated, the more of a response to threat you show. That response to threat involves either freezing or fleeing, or if it's really, really strong and really, really activated, then you go and fight. So the idea is that there are some individuals out there, in fact, if you remember on that very first slide with the reactive aggression, those mood and anxiety conditions put the individual at risk for showing increased responsiveness in this circuitry, and because you have increased responsiveness in this circuitry, you're more likely to lash out when somebody frustrates or frightens you rather than just moving away from the situation or freezing. And this is just one little paradigm that you can look at. So this involves a looming stimulus. There you go. Oops, that was a looming stimulus in the paradigm. Um, uh, that's what the individual sees. Um, there have been other, st uh, other tasks where somebody was pre pretending that a tarantula was coming towards the individual's foot. But uh, for ethical reasons, we do not do that paradigm. We do this rather more benign way of showing a an approaching threat. But what we're looking at is do we see activity in the amygdala and periaqueductal gray, which we do in healthy individuals, when you've got those approaching animate threats coming towards you. And also, you see that significantly more strongly in individuals who are at increased risk for reactive aggression. So the individuals who are lashing out when they're frustrated or when they're frightened are the individuals that are showing heightened responsiveness in this circuitry. Yep, I'll be done in time heightened responsiveness in this circuitry um, to these threat stimuli and in, uh, uh, potentially to frustration um, um, stimuli as well. So this second mechanism, again, we can see, and this idea again is that we're not just seeing this in individuals with antisocial personality disorder, we're not just seeing it in individuals with conduct disorder, we see it in some individuals with anxiety conditions, some individuals with depression, and those individuals are the individuals within the subsets of individuals with those disorders who are at increased risk for reactive aggression if their environmental circumstances prompt the um, aggression, if they're exposed to threat or frustration. Now, I'm not able to really go through the decision-making uh, data in any detail, so I'm just going to um, uh, just talk about how this, the decision-making uh, architecture interacts with, and really only one tiny bit of the decision-making architecture, interacts with that basic threat mechanism. And basically, there's a considerable role. That region above the eyes over there on the left-hand side, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, extremely critical region for representing the value of stimuli and, and, um, and choices. And the idea is that that region is critical for uh, allowing you to make good decisions. You need to choose actions that are going to optimize your reward and avoid actions that are going to lose you, um, uh, you know, make you uh, lose money or make you have negative consequences. And the idea is that basically when you're raging, when somebody's frustrated you or somebody's uh, frightened you, you're getting really angry. A healthy individual, though, knows that really it's not appropriate to go thump the living daylights out of the person. A healthy individual is maybe going to go off into a corner and just, you know, seethe or go gossip to their friend and say, that person's a complete pain in the neck. Did you know what they did to me? Something along the way. They're going to choose an alternative, non-antisocial way of doing things unless the provocation gets too much or unless there's problems in this system for um, uh, representing the um, uh, value of the decisions you're engaged in. And we got to this 
with a different sort of paradigm. This is a, um, a very basic paradigm looking at um, um, decisions for um, fairness allocations. And we do this because allocations that are unfair are a spectacularly provoking way of inducing reactive aggression. If I have $10 and I give you, if I have $20 and I give you 10 and we're supposed to share it out, then you're going to think that's fair, that's perfectly okay, you'll think I'm quite a nice guy. If I have $20 and I'm supposed to share it out and I only give you two, you're going to think, you know, he's not a very nice guy. In fact, that's really unfair. I should do something about that to make sure he's not such an uh, unpleasant individual in the future. And so what we were particularly interested in is what regions were showing a greater response when you got when you were retaliating, because you had in this, in this paradigm the opportunity to retaliate, to take money away. We couldn't get thumping behavior, but we could at least make retaliation by losing the other person's money. And what you see uh, in, uh, that was actually the, the architecture in that uh, approaching threat, you see the same architecture in healthy individuals, amygdala, PA, the amygdala is not depicted, PAG, they get more and more responsive. Um, the more punishment you give to the other person, the more you retaliate, Ventral medial shows a reduced response in that um, circumstance in healthy individuals. The idea it's representing the badness of, or the bad, you know, because you're losing money yourself by retaliating this way, the badness of this decision. What you see, though, in um, uh, patient populations is a failure to um, show um, uh, this reduction in the ventral medial activity, a failure in the um, connection between this region, ventral medial and the amygdala, the top end of that threat circuitry. And importantly, <coughs> the extent of the problem in ventral medial prefrontal cortex is what predicts the individual's level of reactive aggression. So in other words, the more the individual has a problem in representing the value of uh, options, behavior options, the greater they are likely to show reactive aggression. This was a, a, a population of children with child uh, conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. So again, you have problems in this architecture, you see um, uh, increased reactive aggression. And oh, there was supposed to be a, uh, um, something different here. I don't quite know what happened to my slide. But anyway. Um, treatment, um, uh, so look, to, yeah, no, this is the very last slide. Treatment, we could definitely do something about um, um, uh, increased re threat responsiveness. CBT, SSRIs, was mentioned in, 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 in uh, Professor Hackian's um, uh, blog, um, can reduce threat responsiveness. Um, uh, and uh, we may be able to do something about the reduced empathy um, in the context of um, stimulants. This was a study actually showing that Parkinson's disease um, uh, patients given stimulants increased the amygdala response to um, uh, distress cues, and it's been used successfully in at least one behavioral study with um, patients with callous on emotional traits. And my slide thing went completely wrong. Ooh. Oh, and I've lost my last slide. So there you go. Little, neuroscience is little to say about proportional offenders, but there are mechanisms that when dysfunctional increase the risk for antisocial behavior. The idea is that by advancing treatment options targeted on those mechanisms, we will be able to help a chunk of individuals who are engaging in problematic behavior because of problems in these mechanisms, and that will be seen across psychiatric conditions. I'm sorry if it goes so fast. <laughs> That was great. Thank you. You may live. Um, okay. Back to Giordano. Excellent. So when Alan asked me to do this, he said, could you keep it short? <laughs> I can't help it. But let me build upon what, what James said earlier. I mean, clearly, if what we're looking to do is initiate psychiatric treatment in prisons, and of course, we're all in this room as neuroethicists, we can see that the momentum, the trend in psychiatry is to move ever more towards neuropsychiatry. In fact, in your previous talk, what you heard is a host of neuroscientific techniques that are being used in neurology and psychiatry that are being applied to at least assess, if not define, potential mechanisms utilizing the RDOC schemata for potentially aggressive, violent, even criminal behavior. And of course, it ended off on the note that perhaps we should then also use translational methods of neuroscience in neuropsychiatry within prisons. Well, we also have to understand that prisoners do represent a vulnerable population in a variety of different ways, not least of which is that the premises upon their incarceration are wholly based upon their behaviors, and in some cases, assessment of their behaviors and cognitions, which then gets us to the interesting point. What if we can change those? 
What if, in fact, one of the things we can do is utilizing contemporary neuroscientific techniques and technologies, be able to assess these to such a point, to be able to say that there are set points in what may represent to be a normal or abnormal brain, as defined through a variety of different consensus and conventions, and then say if, in fact, we don't only change the behaviors that may be faked, but also change the underlying brain states that are precipitative or in some ways contributory to those behaviors and cognitions, well, then we've affected some positive outcome. Indeed. Well, obviously, this then speaks to some very special characteristics of medicine, clearly neuropsychiatry, ontological claims of psychiatry, and very often here the, the prison incarceration, if not justice system, at large. What are we looking to do here? That's a basic issue. So if we take a look at what these questions mean in the contemporary era, now, moving into the DSM-5 with a whole new set of categorizations, the ICD-10, and clearly looking at initiatives such as the Brain Initiative here in the United States, I think we can pose a Socratic question, and I hope to do that to you. So Socrates posed to, to Phaedrus, if you want to know where you're going, I think it's best to understand from where you've come. And this really gets us to the whole Kowadis question of where we're going with neuroscience and neuropsychiatry vis-a-vis -vis looking at not only prisoners in prison, but the whole idea of criminality and can and should we utilize neuroscientific techniques and technologies for viable public safety, ergo as a public good, and in this way check the proverbial blocks of neuropsychiatry, medicine writ small and large, and perhaps various forms of justice. Well, interestingly, I think if we're going to move forward in such a posture and ask where are we going, we want to look backwards and also take a look, and I think a very, very critical look at such things like leucotomy and lobotomy, also take a look at things like various forms of electroconvulsive therapy and a host of concoctions that we use that were the latest and greatest drugs at the time. Let's not also forget some other things that crept up, including but not limited to phrenology. But I think what we have here is a vision towards the future, and one that, of course, is always balanced between some positivity and negativity. Nobody's posing utopianism or frank dystopianism here, but I think we really are at a fulcral point. So we have two things that we can look at. Given all of these calls for improvement in mental health and the justice system, not only here in the United States, but internationally, specifically in Europe, I pose two issues. Number one, are there ethical, and as Henry Hank will deal in a moment, legal, obligations to utilize medicine in such ways that are truly rehabilitative to the individuals and or B also sustain some measure of recuperative social justice where we're able to recuperate certain losses and at the same time maintain some level of retributive justice to those individuals who've engaged in fraction frank crimes well I don't know the answer to the question but I can certainly take us down those roads and trajectories of possibility and I have that here if, in fact, we say the answer is yes, A, let's take a look at A, where A would essentially be this, provide truly rehabilitative services, then the idea there is can we translate brain science into some viable individual and social public good, and, of course, to what extent should we utilize the tools and techniques that we have? We heard earlier about cognitive behavioral and other forms of therapy, certainly a whole host of new drugs, obviously neuroscience and neurotechnology, and where do we go with that? Neuromodulation or more invasively? particularly if these are, in fact, resistant problems. And we define various RDOC mechanisms that are viable to be targets. And we see by affecting those targets, we get good outcomes. If, in fact, we also then say we're going to move on to accept premise B, we then have to say, what should these outcomes and goals be? Such as what? Well, perhaps, as we heard earlier, mitigation or complete cessation of violence and aggression, more appropriate types of behaviors, change in cognitive and behavioral parameters, and perhaps even reintegration into society so as to get more of a recuperative as well as rehabilitative mode, and in this way, counterbalance our retributive aspects with one that then contributes back to society. Check in the block for medicine, check in the block for justice, check in the block for neuroscience and neuroethics. Maybe. There are a lot of decisions that need to be made here, and of course, what are we going to do this? What conditions, what states? We've heard of some here earlier, but not all. Not all individuals who are behind bars have psychopathic tendencies, are antisocial or otherwise. There are a whole host of other conditions that may indeed evoke a variety of psychiatric states that could be viewed to be problematic in a host of different social conditions. You should be getting the heebie-jeebies here a little bit. This gets into a yellow flag, if not red flag zone, because the idea there is in whom? Who are these people? How do we define these people? How do we do that? And what is the level of evaluation? Is this a medical evaluation? Yes, surely. Is it a social evaluation? 
Are we utilizing neuroscience and neurotechnology to define the norms and then move ahead from that? And then we get into whole other issues and how we utilize said neuroscience and neurotechnology, irrespective of the context, this being one, context being a point that I brought up earlier this morning in our first panel discussion. And of course, if we look at trying to balance brain science in these ways in this vulnerable population, we see this as a very Anusian characteristic. The possibility for doing very good things are there. The possibility for doing some not good things are equally there. And I have these issues listed for you. What is the viability of consent, even if there's some implicit level of coercion that may be involved? Are we medicalizing criminality to some extent, the point that Dr. Herrera Farrar raised earlier this morning? Is this social control? What about the continuity of care? If we're going to engage these services, do we need to continue them status post release from prison? And of course, who pays? What does this mean? And the idea here is how do we view these benefits and what are the harms on a variety of different levels that can range from individual, criminal, social, and perhaps even beyond? Obviously, what this evokes is a host of potential perspectives, and I give you three here. We started out with perspectives coming from the brain sciences, and we have to balance this with a very Benthamian perspective as to if they can suffer, then should we relieve that suffering? Are they suffering? But Benthamian concepts of justice, I think, are also very, very applicable in this particular case, something that Hank Greeley will deal with momentarily as we get from that point to go from neuroscience to neurology, psychiatry, neuroethics, and ultimately neurolaw. But of course, the other issue here is what are we actually doing with the neuroscientific techniques and technologies we have at hand? And this conjures up, if you will, dystopian visions such as those evoked by Anthony Burgess, Clockwork Orange. Are we, in fact, moving ever more towards this area, being able to engage social engineering experiments? And of course, should we? If, in fact, it's that very society that defines what is legal and what is not, and is that not the goal, to protect the polis? And if we have these tools at our capacity, then should we not engage them appropriately to affect such public goods? I don't have answers for you. I'm just a little guy. That's why we have a situation like this, where we have a bunch of neuroscientists and neuroethicists in a big room putting our heads together. We've tried. Some of my previous work with very esteemed colleagues has looked at the ability to harness neuroscience and neurotechnology for agendas of public safety. We looked at the assessment side of the house, and increasingly we're also looking at the interventional side of the house. And I think in looking at both of them, we have to also weigh and try to balance what do we know about neuroscience, what can it do, what are its limitations, and what are its delimitations, and do so with a very, very prudent eye. I've put forth a whole set of potential characteristics that may be somewhat algorithm to how we may want to evaluate various neurotechnologies. And this came out in the American, American Medical Association's Journal of Ethics, it used to be called Virtual Mentor. It's now the AMA Journal of Ethics, it came out in 2015. That was really the culmination of a series of, of pieces we had put together working with Bill Casebury and a host of other colleagues to essentially formulate the groundwork to pose a series of questions and steps that would need to be checked off or at least addressed repeatedly if looking to use neuroscience and neurotechnology in these ways. And these are some of the steps ahead. Obviously, we need to see all of these things, medicine, neuropsychiatry, brain science, justice system as viable social goods. What society, what goods? There are a number of tripping hazards here. Yes, we may be looking at this forward vista and say, isn't this wonderful to utilize psychiatry and neuropsychiatry in these ways? But as we look forward, are we also looking down? And are these things going to not only make us stumble, are they also going to come up and bite us in the fanny at some point in the future? Clearly, what we're calling for is not only a pragmatic look, vis-a-vis -vis Eric Racine's very fine book about pragmatic neuroethics, in a very Deweyan sense, but also, obviously, a precautionary view. I do not advocate a precautionary principle in its strictest sense, because I don't think it's tenable. I think it's anachronistic, and I think the field is moving forward. So I think a precautionary view as to things what could be harmful, burdensome, then sets us up to what we can really do and not do with brain sciences and what it means, and that's our preparedness stance. And ultimately, putting these things into the crucible of possibility, giving it a good shake, and moving ahead prudently in our practices. You know, I like to say in many of the neuroethics lectures that I give that my dad was an engineer, and one of the things he taught me when I was a kid is measure twice, cut once. Well, here too, and I'll evoke sort of my father's spirit in this particular lecture because I think it's applicable. Here we need to measure twice before our actions, but the question then becomes, do we stop there? No, not at all. I advocate measuring again during and after what it is that we're doing. Is it working? What is it working to do? What are the goods that we're evoking? And of course, it's not just a question of measuring brains and the individuals in which those brains are embodied, but also measuring our own science and certainly taking measure of our own neuroethics. I thank you for your time. If you'd like to get in touch with me, that's where I live.
So don't feel any pressure, Dr. Greeley. This is a fabulous panel. You're on. That's about to change. <laughs> I'm just amazed. I think Jordana went short of his time. Oh. <laughs> See, it's, it's, if I hear one more short joke today. It wasn't intended to be a short joke, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so my first reaction when I saw that this panel was going to be on the program was surprise. And my second reaction was to be surprised at my first reaction. And I want to talk a little bit about that before I get into five specific issues about mental health in prison. Why was I surprised? Well, I, I, my first reaction was, is it a neuroethics issue? Is mental health in prisons a neuroethics issue? Which gets into a question that I've tried to avoid in my 10 or 12 years in neuroethics, which is, what is neuroethics? You know, when people raise that question, I try to change the subject for the most part. Um, but if I'm pushed, I go to a pragmatic definition. Neuroethics is stuff that's published that people think is neuroethics. Neuroethics is what neuroethicists publish, or is what gets published in neuroethics places. And my casual empirical view had been there really hasn't been very much neuroethics published with respect to mental illness, and particularly with respect to mental illness in prisons. Now, it is always uncomfortable, especially for a lawyer, to come into conflict with possible adverse facts. And as I was listening to the abstract presentations, I then went over and looked at the uh, Leafard uh, et al. Uh, abstract. And they showed that 16% of the publications in neuroethics are, in fact, about neurodegenerative disease or psychiatric disease. I saw that, and I wondered, gosh, 15 percentage points of those are obviously in the neurodegenerative. And then I thought, well, maybe I'm actually just proving their other point, which is the different parts of neuroethics don't talk to each other very much. But for whatever reason, in my corner of neuroethics, I don't see very much about mental health. It's not something we've talked very much about. And I think, in part, if you pushed me for a non-pragmatic definition of neuroethics, it would be the ethical, legal, and social implications arising from advances in, progress in, better understanding of the human brain and human behavior. And unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of progress with respect to mental health. Uh, there's been some, certainly, but you look at things like drug therapies and the last 20 years have been disappointing to be kind. And so maybe that's why we haven't seen very much of it. I'm, not, I'm still not sure whether I think this is a neuroethics issue, although parts of it clearly are neuroethics issues, but I do think it's a really important issue. And it's an important issue. Mental health is a particularly important issue. Mental health in prisons is one particular shameful subset of it. But it is an important issue, and that's been brought home to me recently as I've had a close relative deal with a serious depressive illness. Uh, there's nothing like seeing someone you care about go through something like that to realize just how much hav havoc mental illness wrecks on people, on their families, on their friends, on their social structure. So I am still somewhat agnostic about the extent to which it's a neuroethics issue, but I'm not agnostic about the extent to which people working in neuroethics should pay more attention to it and should work on it. I think it's important. Mental health in prisons. I've got five points. I'm going to be very parochial. Usually I apologize for talking only about American issues. I'm going to do it again. I'm kind of like the drunk in the lamppost. American issues are the only ones I know about, so that's the only place I look and the only thing I talk about. I've got more justification than usual here, because although the United States has only 4% of the world's population, it has 25% of the world's incarcerated people. So we're number one uh, with a bullet, so to speak. Um, five points. First, are too, many mental, are too many mentally ill people put in prison or in jail? And I think the answer to that is almost certainly yes, without even getting to the question of whether mental disease, whether mental illness should be more of an excusing factor that, that eliminates culpability and means that people shouldn't be found guilty, so some of the people who are found guilty shouldn't be. That's one whole area of neuroethics. I'm not even thinking about that. I'm thinking about people who show up for whom prison or jail isn't going to do them or society any good, and there might be better <coughs> alternatives. There is a movement that I think deserves 
good attention, close attention, as well as measure twice, cut once attention for mental health courts that try to divert people from prisons and from jails and into better facilities, better treatment systems that are a win-win for both them and the society. Of course, the problem with that is we don't have that many facilities out there and that many units out there in which those people and treatment programs in which they can get treatment. We effectively deinstitutionalized the mentally ill 30 or 40 years ago in this country, the result of which is many of them have been reinstitutionalized, not in mental hospitals, but in prisons. There are people for whom there is not necessarily a good outside free living, uh, living situation, and many of them end up in prison because there's no other place for them to go. That's a problem. It costs more, it's bad for them, it's not helping society any. So issue one, too many in prison? Yes. Issue two, are they getting good mental health treatment? The easy, overwhelming answer to that is no. One, in that we don't have as good mental health treatments as we would like, even for people for whom we're willing to spend a lot of time and attention and money. And second, prisoners are not people for whom we're willing to spend a lot of time and attention and money. They're not people the taxpayers want to coddle. They're not people that um, are going to be able to get the best psychiatric help in the best facilities. Their movements are quite limited. It's, it's expensive to move them to hospitals, to MRI scanners, to other things. It's not going to happen, and it hasn't happened. This is kind of ironic, because prisoners are among the only people, the only people in the United States who have a legal right to health care, including mental health care. Even under Obamacare, Americans don't have a right to health care. But if you are imprisoned or otherwise forcibly detained by your government, you've got a constitutional right to health care. The U.S. Supreme Court decided this with respect to mental health care in prisons in Estelle v. Gamble in 1976. It's there in the Supreme Court reports. All that's very nice. What does it really mean? Not very much. Some judges have taken over prison health systems or prison mental health systems, and they found it a very frustrating thing. It is hard for judges to run big public institutions, whether they're prisons, whether they're school districts, whether they're anything else, because too many of the levers of power remain in the hands of politics, of budget, of bureaucracies over whom the judges have very limited control. So there is a legal right, and yet the extent of, the, of quality mental health care given overall in prisons and jails in the United States is extraordinarily low. Point three, do prisons cause mental health problems? And I think there the answer is also probably yes. Things like solitary confinement, there's increasing evidence that oddly enough, being stuck in a hole for 23 hours a day and being able to go out once for one hour a day by yourself and an exercise room that contains no one but yourself is not very good for you. This is not actually, I don't think it took brain science to actually tell us that. This may be one of these things where neuroscience just provides pretty pictures to show us what we always knew, like teenagers are different from real people. But it's driving people crazy. And that is wrong. Prison should not actually do things that knowingly are going to make people worse, but we don't have a very good hook for that either, in part because the prisons say, with some, plausible, some plausibility as a security issue, there are people who are so dangerous that we can't let them have contact with others because they're going to try to kill the others. And in the context of many of our high security prisons with gangs uh, that are uh, strongly dedicated to fighting each other because they've got nothing else to do in prison, uh, that may actually be right. That's not going to be an easy argument to win. You might be able to win it on an Eighth Amendment claim under the American constitutional provision that says you cannot do cruel and unusual punishment. That has been making very slow progress with respect to the death penalty. But part of that progress has come because the death penalty has gotten more and more unusual. And solitary confinement, unfortunately, has gotten more and more usual. So. Are we making people mentally ill in prison? Yes, I'm afraid we are. Issue four is the one that I think, what I think of as neuroethics has begun to approach some, more on the science fiction side than on the reality side, and that is what about mandatory treatments? 
Again, the U.S. Supreme Court actually has spoken about this in a case called Washington v. Harper in 1990. It laid out standards for what kind of process has to be given prisoners who are not imminently dangerous to themselves or others when the prison wants to give them involuntary, usually in this, ca in this case, drugs to treat their mental illnesses. We have had some speculation about things like anti-cocaine vaccines and whether you could involuntarily give that to people, uh, or um, psychosurgery to re reduce or eliminate somebody's violent tendencies or direct brain stimulation, deep brain stimulation or other things. Not currently plausible. Those raise interesting questions. We've got one example that currently is being done in several American states, and that is so-called chemical castration for male sex offenders. It acts on the sex organs, but it also acts on the biggest sex organ, which is the brain. It is a neurointervention in that respect. We're not paying all that much attention to what the effects of that are. I think there's useful normative neuroethics work to be done with respect to the appropriate limits for involuntary treatment of prisoners and of non-prisoners, of adults and of children. Uh, Nita Farahani has been uh, looking, has been working on this on her upcoming book on cognitive liberty. I think there's a lot to be said there that neuroethics uh, has contributed and can continue to contribute. But I think also looking at what the realities are and the plausible near-term near near -term realities will be, will be useful. Fifth and last point, what is to be done? And as I thought about this, it occurred to me that maybe one of the reasons people don't write about this too much is it's too depressing. When I give talks, when I get to the point that says what is to be done, I like to have some good answers to that. I worry that there aren't really good answers here. The best thing we could do is get better treatments for mental illness across the board for prisoners and non-prisoners. Although I'm afraid I can guarantee that at least if they are expensive and do not appeal to prison guards and prison wardens on the grounds of making people more manageable, prisoners will be the last people to get them. But getting better treatments would be a good thing. Having said that, we also have to worry though, as Jim pointed out, prisoners are a vulnerable group. And so you don't necessarily want to allow too much research being done on prisoners in order to get those improved treatments. That raises problems of its own. Second thing we could do, we could improve the delivery of treatments in prison, but I think that's going to be awfully hard. And the governments and their, and their voters don't want to spend money on prisoners. If you get forced by increasing litigation to try to do it, you may get some action, but the judges who are trying to enforce that are going to find themselves in a difficult and frustrated, and frustrated position. Some litigation, particularly I think the Eighth Amendment litigation on solitary confinement, might work because it's not that expensive to do it. But all in all, I think pressure should be kept up to try to improve what is a shameful state of American prisons. The only ray of hope I see is the tsunami of incarceration seems to be receding. Prison populations in the United States have gone down slightly in the last three or four years. It's like 1% in the last three or four years, but since they've been going up at several percent a year for decades before then, that's to be celebrated. And maybe as those facilities get less used and the budgets for taking care of prisoners get smaller, maybe some of them can be converted back to or into mental health facilities and mental health hospitals. I don't think we're gonna see new money added, but maybe old money can be redirected. So, is it a neuroethics issue? I don't know. Is it an important issue? Are we doing terrible things and letting terrible things happen to people? Knowing, if we wanna think about it, that these are happening, and knowing that it is governments, our government's faults? Yes. Should something be done about it? Yes. Can neuroethics people talk about it? Yes. Can we fix it? I don't know. But I think we have to try. Thank you. I love this panel. This was fabulous. All right. Now you can start lining up. But you're not going to talk yet. I'm good. No, line up. Hardly. Helen, go ahead. You can line up, but first I have to give you the rules. So this part is called questions, not speeches. You had the speeches, all right? Would you like the definition of a question? 
The question is where your voice goes up at the end, no matter where you come from. Your voice goes up for the, for, at the end, it's short, and it does not have a long preamble. Got it? Okay. Now, I'll let you go first. I, I have a bunch of my own, too. That, that was, you guys are fabulous. You better be as good, you people. Okay, <laughs> Helen, say my other rules, say who you are, where you come from, and then you're on. Okay. Um, Helen Mayberg, I'm from Emory University. So, given that one can define a neuroscience of antisocial behavior, and given that you can define an identifiable neuroscience principle that you could test and treat, how would you design the clinical trial? Because as James said, you want to test twice, verify, and follow. And given the nature of informed consent and the rules of informed consent for prisoners to be involved in more than minimal risk procedures, how could you set it up given that you have an identifiable finding, how could you test it? Eh? How could you test it? That? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. You There's did a question it. There. That was good. Who's on? Um, Go ahead. So I think the easiest way to test it is you don't test it in jail for exactly these um, ethical issues. You uh, work with, uh, I mean, what I do is work with children with conduct disorder. They come into clinics or they come into um, um, residential treatment centers. And, um, and so um, it's just like being at a regular um, hospital or the alternative they're in the community and coming in from the community. So you don't hit those sorts of um, coercive, coercive practice issues that you would if you were doing a, um, a treatment trial on uh, patients in a, in a jail. And then, of course, the idea would be that that information from community samples or hospital samples can be propagated to forensic samples if it turns out to be useful. Yeah, so um, I have a couple of takes on, a, on one aspect of that, and that's the idea of mandatory treatments to affect somebody's criminality, recidivism, et cetera. Two different points. One is if the legislature gets excited about it and thinks, thinks it's going to save them money, they don't test it. They just do it. That's what we've seen with chemical castration. Nine states in the United States require chemical castration for some male Sex offenders, chemical castration usually involves uh, Depo, uh, Depo Provera, a birth control pill that blocks testosterone. Um, there is good evidence that surgical castration greatly reduces recidivism for sex criminals. Oddly enough, it's not 100% reduction, but it's pretty high. This evidence comes mainly from Northern European practices in the 20th century. There isn't very good evidence about uh, chemical castration, but Legislatures don't care because it's, it's, it's tough on crime, it saves money, and nobody cares about sex offenders anyway. So, <laughs> Helen, one issue, one problem is getting somebody to even care enough to know whether it works on the political stage. The second also political problem, think about this. Let's say you've got something that you think you can treat criminals in a way that makes them safer. And so you treat them, you release them, and Maybe it's wonderfully effective, except the one person in 100 goes off and rapes and murders somebody. And you are the governor who authorized that. Um, some of you may remember Michael Dukakis, who had a problem with that in his presidential election. The political costs to the government of doing something risky with respect to crime are high. So I worry about, not, I, I think there are good technical and ethical problems with clinical trials in this area. Maybe it's because I'm a law professor, but I also worry a lot about some of the political barriers to using them and using them well. Okay, yes please. Who are you anyway? Who am I anyway? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I'm Tim Brown. I am um, from the University of Washington. I'm a graduate student. Um, I also work with the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, um, and I'm a neuroethics uh, researcher there too. Um, so my question is sort of uh, an attempt to fill in a couple of gaps. So Hank, you might mention that um, America is the leader in incarcerations. Um, but I think it's also important to note that uh, 
about 58% of those incarcerations are Hispanics and blacks. And so I was wondering, what's the racial dimension here? So for example, if, if a legislature tests out a new way of, you know, well, test out a new technology. So for example, if DBS ever does make it to prisons, um, will that just mean that the black community and the Hispanic community are the test subjects? Um, and how does that change uh, how we approach the issues at large? You want Thank to you. Anybody want to tackle? You haven't talked yet. I'll probably say something I'm, I'm not sure if it's, if, I'm not sure if that really hits the nail on the head. I mean, certainly I think it's always a concern when you have not only vulnerable populations who are prisoners, yeah. but what percentage of the population those prisoners are. You've got two issues here. The first is you're dealing with prisoners, per se, irrespective of whatever race, whatever gender they may be. That's an issue. Yes. And the second is the representation of various groups as prisoners based upon the commission of whatever crime is deemed to be sort of socially relevant to then incarcerate them. Mm -hmm. That gets into Hank's camp. The question of whether or not that then would determine particular patterns of testing neuropsychiatric interventions on unique groups of individuals, I think it really just reflects what would be the, quote, target population as with any well-designed research study. You would say we're looking to determine, as we heard earlier, perhaps you can utilize studies outside of the, quote, prison environment to be able to assure all the necessary groundwork is then for what we discussed earlier as the, the six C's, the six W's, and, and the six R's, all contingent upon we're asking the necessary questions before we even consider the possibility of posing this for consent and then engaging the possibility for engaging the consequences of what this would be. So I think, as we said earlier, this is a complex issue, not only because of the prison population per se, but also because the prison population may have as its, as its representative population a host of, of groups of individuals that then may also represent extra prison target populations as well. But that's, I kind of view that as an apples and oranges issue. I mean, certainly one that would need to be considered with regard to how we use various interventions in a host of different phenotypes, representation of those neuro and psychophenotypes in various groups, but that's not just a prison issue, okay? okay? And I guess I would just add, if I were running such a study, I would think it prudent to try to have my uh, study population be, clo be more, be closer to representative of the outside population than the prison population, even though that's going to cause me some uh, heartache and, and difficulty in being representative. I think if I went with a sample population, a study population that was overwhelmingly black and Hispanic, I would be buying myself, I hope, in most states today at least, a host of political problems that I'd rather avoid. So let me just let me put a bow on that at the end. Earlier in our first talk, Dr. Blair talked about our doc type of characteristics. And I think one of the missional ideas here is to determine what those characteristics are and then in who those characteristics occur and are they in fact brain representations of phenotypes that then reliably and penetrably project into certain cognitive and behavioral outcomes, irrespective of whoever that may be. And that then creates a model for then utilizing these interventions, once again, irrespective of wherever these people are found. In this particular case, are they representative in a prison population? Okay? Oh. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. You see people struggling in the back. Yeah, get closer to the mic, <laughs> too. It works better. Hi, uh, this is Kevin Chen Chang Wu. I'm from Taiwan, uh, National Taiwan University. I'm a practicing forensic psychiatrist. I have both training in uh, psychiatry and the law. I have, two, I have two questions. The first is, can a person feign his brain functioning by training? And my second question is, when it comes to uh, mental health issues, in addition to talking about neuroscience, can neuroethicists say something beyond those covered by traditional psychiatric ethics? Thank you. Okay, 
I don't mind commenting on You get the one. first one. Okay, I, so I can definitely comment on question one. Is there evidence that uh, training or at least therapy can change um, uh, brain functioning? Yes, there's very clear evidence that uh, therapy can change brain functioning. There's not good data in the context of forensic samples, but there's very good data with respect to PTSD and um, uh, depression and a whole host of um, conditions that are risk factors, or at least and, and the underlying mechanisms are risk factors for at least that sort of reactive aggression problems that I was talking about. So yes, there's very good reasons to, to, to think that therapy will change and that will propagate into um, uh, b benefit for the individual. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer part of the second question. I'm going to hand it over to Hank because I think Hank used a term that I like to use, which is NELSI, neuroethical, legal, and social issues. But I think if you take a look at what, what psychiatry does, not in a Sazian way, but in, in a real issue of what psychiatry does, whether in clinical practice or forensically, it bridges that. It goes from the neuro all the way to the social because we make particular normative definitions in terms of what behaviors and what cognitions are socially acceptable, whether that's in a DSM, an ICD, or whatever. Right? I think the, the question of whether or not these issues are exclusively neuroethical issues, questions, or problems, or whether they're also concomitant psychiatric ethics issues, questions, and problems is a larger one. Where do we draw the boundaries now as we move into the 21st century between neuroscience, brain science, and psychiatry? Earlier this morning, we heard, I think, a very, very interesting take that said that mental health issues are brain issues. And increasingly, that's becoming the case. We're looking at these things this way. Perhaps not universally, but certainly we can say that there's at least some common substrates there. The question then becomes, are there some uniquities, unique things that we're doing in the brain sciences, whether we use it in psychiatry, neurology, pain medicine, that clearly are the provence of neuroethics? And I think the answer to that question is yes, but then its field of application may be in these various disciplines. In some cases, they intersect. In some cases, there's something unique or special about the nature of the neuroscientific or neurological basis of that, irrespective of whatever is the application within various disciplines that perhaps may be germane here. And I think I may just be repeating Jim, but more briefly. Um, <laughs> in short. Cool. See, <laughs> see the guy I love. Um, there's certainly, there's certainly overlapping, um, and that's part of what I was wondering about in terms of is this really a neuroethics issue and not just a psychiatric ethics issue or a medical ethics issue. The issues overlap, and sometimes people will go at them at the same way. I think the psychiatric ethics will tend to be more individual patient or patient, doctor patient um, oriented. The neuroethics, I think, can bring in, is more likely to bring in broader social contexts and broader social implications. That's a generalization, and there'll both be narrow neuroethics and broad psychiatric ethics. I also think the neuroethics is more likely to be able to and be interested in dealing with recent um, advances, recent discoveries, and be more attuned to that, and maybe a little, I hope, more sophisticated in dealing with, quote, breakthroughs, close quote, than psychiatric or medical ethics might be. So an interest, I can't control myself. So I'm not. We got a drug that can fix that. Yeah. <laughs> or I'm, a surgery. I'm not sure it matters whether yeah. it's different yeah. from a psychiatric ethics issue. And, and certainly, as I just said, as we understand more about the fact that you don't actually have a separate mind and body, um, it, it's going to go away as, as a distinction. As, as somebody, I used to have a sign in my office that said disciplines died um, as everything in the world has become more multidisciplinary. It was, was right next to the sign that said Freud died, um, next to the one that said Descartes died. Um, so the same principle holds. It's, it's not clear. There is no question that the issues posed relate to ethics and relate to brain, and particularly to brain intervention and the potential. For, so to answer Hank's question, sure it's a neuro, he said it was too. Um, sure it's a neuroethics issue, but I'm not sure it's taken up in, a, in that way, and that may be the question. All right, shut up, Alan, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Allison Lynch. I'm a practicing attorney out of New York City, and- Good. Do uh, it into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Pull it down. In heels, and I'm still short. 
Um, <laughs> my name is Allison Lynch. I'm a practicing attorney out of New York City, and the majority of my clients are individuals with mental illness who are somehow justice involved, so this issue is particularly one that speaks to me, um, and I also have a background in neuroscience, so this was kind of all my things together. Um, Two-part question. The first part, very broadly, is ethically, do you all see that there is some current practical application of neuroscience and information that's available for attorneys who are in the field working with this population? If the answer to that question is yes, the second part of my question is, how would you recommend the implementation of those applications given the limitations of the information that we know and given the tendency of the legal profession to kind of grasp onto a scientific principle and run with it until it's no longer valid? Please do. So unfortunately, I hate to say, I think the answer is basically no, despite what, there are people out there who would definitely give you a very different answer, but for me, if we're going to be using the neuroscience data, we need to be able to say that we have a test that will give us a percentile of where somebody lies on that test. So that the 95th percentile, we know they've got a real problem, and we know that that predicts something useful. Right now, we have a whole bunch of data that you know I was trying to show you that actually um, um, that we, is the beginnings of that sort of information, and that hopefully will be useful enough to give us percentiles that will then be applicable to the individual. But I don't think we're ready um, now. I certainly am not convinced. I know at least one member in the audience who's very vigorously um, on that view as well. So, uh, yeah, so I would go no for that. Okay. Yeah, and I'm afraid I would for the most part. I think there has been a fair amount of effort to make neuroscience information more accessible to judges and lawyers. Uh, the AAALS, uh, the AAAS has put on programs for judges, the Federal Judicial Center has. Shameless self-promotion, I've got a co-authored chapter in the uh, desk reference on scientific evidence for federal judges that goes into, that tries to help lawyers and judges understand neuroscience principles better, but it's, but I don't know of anything dealing with the mental health slash neuroscience issues very well. I think those things are useful to get to a basic knowledge of the neuroscience that allows the judges, we hope, to be a little less dangerous. Uh, but on the mental health specific side, if, there, if it's out there, I don't know about it. Jim, you were poised. Mm -hmm. no? Okay. So I have a bit of a different question. I'm Jen from McGill. Um, so given that LGBT youth and transgender people have been more in focus in recent years over um, mass incarceration, and that 47% of transgendered adults will at some point find themselves in prison, do you think that the prison healthcare system has a mandate legally to provide them with the hormone therapy that they, re they request? <laughs> Can you say the last part again slowly? Sorry. Do you think that the prison healthcare system, given their legal mandate, has a requirement or some kind of duty to provide transgendered people who find themselves in jail with hormone replacement therapy? So there's, there may be an answer to it. I don't know that. That's probably being litigated as we speak. If it's not being litigated today, I'm confident that it will be litigated soon. Um, and I don't know how that litigation will come out. The Supreme Court in the Estelle case mm -hmm. basically said you can't willfully turn your back on. You've got to provide necessary appropriate treatment, but what the belt borders are of necessary and appropriate is always going to be fuzzy, and particularly in an area that's been exploding in public consciousness <coughs> recently as uh, uh, transgender issues. So. I don't know, but I bet it's being litigated. So, so let, me, let me add to that a little bit, but I don't think it's going to add to it much because I think the ultimate decision is, is really going to be a legal one because there's really no other way around it, particularly given a prison population. But let's go outside the prison population as an exemplar and then back it up. I think one of the challenges, if not opportunities, for neuroscience here is to be able to define viable substrates for transgender-like issues. Now, what that actually means, it may also mean, for example, changing that nomenclature to be a little less more socially burdened, if not biased, stigmatizing. But this has been in the literature for a long time. I mean, we can look, take a look at some of the older work, for example, on homosexuality, bisexuality, some of the very, very old work of Gunter Derner, all the way up to Simon LeVay's very, very well done work, which has been controversial. And now moving more into that, the idea that, in fact, there may be some very, very different brain structures and functions that are involved 
Not necessarily to say this is an abnorm, something that is deviant. However, to suggest that well, we have an abnormality because we have one particular somatic expression and another type of brain organization, which would suggest a disparity. If that's the case, then what you're saying is, well, okay, this would then be corrective to be able to align body with brain. In which case, we see a pendulum swing to say that this represents something that is therapeutic in the strictest sense because you've defined what the basis of the pathology is, or at least the abnorm. Prior to that, however, I think that it becomes sort of a fuzzy distinction because not all cases where you have an individual who is seeking gender reassignment surgery may have the underlying, quote, necessary mechanisms, substrates, or in this case, changes in structure and function that would define them as a neurologically viable case for that. So I think that this is both a challenge at one point and an opportunity. The question is, are we going to do it inductively or deductively? Are we turning over stones that we think we need to turn over, or is it an agnostic search and we find things that indeed may be representative of this? And the answer is not back yet, but I think that there's an ongoing push in that direction that may then in some ways inform what the guidelines, policies, and ultimately laws may be inclusive of what happens in prison. So Jim made me think of something I should have said earlier. The prison uh, setting will be at best required to do what reasonable practitioners outside Correct. do. And so you're not gonna get it in prison until it's viewed as standard of care outside prison. Standard of care is something that evolves um, you commit malpractice if you fall below the standard of care. You don't commit malpractice if what you do turns out to be wrong. Even if 10 years later everybody agrees it was wrong, if they didn't think so at the time, you know, bleeding with leeches was not malpractice when it helped George Washington die earlier. So change the standard of care outside prisons, and you've got a much better argument for changing the standard of care inside prison, and I don't know where the standard of care is now for that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Schwartz. I am a research psychiatrist at UCLA. And this is uh, a follow-up amplification of a previous question. Um, training and neuroscience. Dr. Blair gave a very nice list, and of course, obsessive compulsive disorder could be added to the list of neuropsychiatric disorders treated effectively by training and changing the brain. I'd like to just ask, uh, Professor Greeley, wonderful presentation. Physical treatments have been disappointing. Excellent quote, in my opinion. And um, I aim for understatement. <laughs> and um, a number of the issues of today's panel could be ameliorated significantly if non-physical treatments which change the brain were supported by neuroethicists as preferential treatments because the controversy is much less, the neuroscience is real, and to raise my voice at the end of the question, Dr. Greeley, do you think that would be a good idea? <laughs> well, first, Dr. Schwartz, it's good to see you again. I think I only see you once a year at these where you always ask a provocative question. We should rectify that situation. But you always ask a provocative question at me. Um, <laughs> I like you. Really? <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, I don't know. Um, in a way, I think it comes back to standard of care. Convince the rest of the world that these work. Convince practitioners, a substantial chunk of practitioners that these work. Do the kind of trials, uh, the, the rigorous clinical trials that will be convincing, get those funded and get those through. And I think, yes, if, you can, if, if there's enough proof, changing things always requires more proof than you would think. Changing an existing, inertia is the greatest force in human affairs for good and for bad. But um, if the proof is there, I think ultimately it will win out. Uh, I don't know how far the proof is there, except in some areas. I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, and some conditions, including some that people I know well are using, uh, can work quite well. How broadly that's true, I don't know, Gary. I'm just a law professor. Dr. Blair assertively said he thought it was true. We're, so. not, we're not going to go back and forth. Dr. Blair, comment, please. 
again, I mean, does do all, any individual therapy work for all individuals? Clearly not. Um, uh, do, does CBT work for a number of people with depression? Clearly does. Um, um, it, uh, you know, it also works with PTSD. You know, the, the data is out there that some treatments do work for a body of people. They clearly don't work for everybody. And indeed, one of the processes of doing the, the neuroscience data is hopefully to identify what are the predictive variables that determine whether this intervention versus that intervention is the best one to do with the individual. There's clearly going to be genetics that, that information in that as well, probably. But there's a whole bunch of neurobiological data that's going to be relevant to that. Um, so I think we'll move to a situation where we're going to have relatively individualized treatments based around mechanisms dysfunction, um, and um, um, and life will be good. I'm much more optimistic than perhaps some other members of the panel, perhaps you are, but I'm an extremely optimistic human being, so I'm hoping that we can do some good in the world. Amen. But, but let, me, let me add something to this, if I could. You know, one of the reasons why a lot of neuroethicists don't deal with some of the non-interventional or non-technological interventions is because those interventions aren't problematic. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it simply doesn't raise, quote, its ugly head. A lot of the things that you hear talked about in these types of conferences, innovative neuropsychopharmacology, the use of various innovative and novel technologies, not only because they're cutting edge and they're new and they're provocative, because in many cases they're problematic, which basically substantiates your claim. There are a whole host of other therapies that are not problematic. We're not going to deal with them here. You know, we're going to say, yeah, they're great if they work. But I think Dr. Blair's comment is a wonderful one because part of the mission is also to determine what works in whom and why so as to be able to then take that approach, the precision medicine approach, if you will, and add to that these non-invasive sort of invasive interventions that have been demonstrated to work quite well. And if we can do this a priori, well, now we've won even more of that battle, right? Right. Sure. Freud is dead. Descartes is dead. And Francis Crick has passed away as well. It's true. He did. You're on. How do I follow that? Um, you could say that Thomas Sass is dead. <laughs> yeah. Jim Watson is. So I, I'm Matthew Baum. I'm an MD-PhD student at Harvard Medical School. And my question relates somewhat to the, to the RDOC, this kind of shift to thinking about uh, disorder as um, at the level of, of mechanism that kind of influences the likelihood of various behaviors, some of which we view to be problematic, namely reactive or instrumental violence. So, uh, you know, there's the concept of, you know, when or whether short, that's... Short. I'm, t I'm talking to Jim. It's okay. Uh, I'm also short, so... so um, <laughs> you so, that short. I, yeah. I didn't notice it before he started. Okay. So this is getting longer. That's, started. Is, okay. But anyway, so, you know, thinking of disorders as likelihood of, of behaviors, you know, that leads to treatments, potentially, but also there are other predictions that we make that are relevant to prisoners, namely predictions of future violence in parole hearings. So when, how do you think we should think about whether these tools are ready for predictions of future violence in parole hearings and weigh that against the kind of clinical uh, predictions that we currently use? So let me, let me start it and then I'll hand it off to Dr. Blair. I think one of the, the working cautions... use the mic? I'm sorry, one of the working cautions that we have to have is that not only do these types of assessment and or diagnostic neurotechnological and neuroscientific approaches bear some, some diagnost true diagnostic weight in terms of the fact that they're naming a disorder as X, they're also framing it within the context of these things, whether we do this according to RDOC criteria or extant DSM or ICD, but then you're also making particular claims that go along with that. So once I frame something, I then make claims that are derivative from that. And the issue there is that whether those claims implicitly or explicitly also then assign blame. Not only present blame, but potential blame in the future that because you have X, the likelihood of then Y and Z having some perpetuity, irrespective of whatever we do, or unless we do something, is going to be relatively high. So I think that the burden, particularly in these types of things, is, yeah, we look to have some approach to naming it and making particular framing context about it, but we have to be very, very cautious and prudent about then the claims and blames that are assigned to that, particularly when we're looking at things like predictive neurotechnologies or utilizing these neurotechnological and neuroscientific approaches in a quasi-predictive way. That was one of the problems that we encountered in some of the work that we were looking at, not only with regard to criminality, but also just aggressive behavior escalating towards potential violence. 
So you've raised a very, very good point, and I think one that presents, as I mentioned, a potential tripping hazard. Yes, we may look forward with great positive apprehension, but there is this tripping hazard that we're aware of that sits right in front of us, which is what diagnosis has always done. One need only to take a look at something like drapetomania and say, well, oh, look at the burden of an inaccurate diagnosis and what that has then done, right? Sir. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is, again, we're not at the place where we can do these predictions terribly successfully. We don't have the data. The trouble is that these studies, even my, you know, the biggest study as I do is still 70 or so subjects. You can't make a psychometric t task out of 70 or, or so subjects. There's extremely entertaining work from NIDA with respect to who's going to relapse. Um, from various different types of interventions. But again, all of these ends are relatively small end studies, and so you can't actually apply that to the clinical setting as it stands now. One, one of the things I'm hoping that we will be doing over the next few years, because we'll have hopefully the opportunity with large end sub studies, is to be able to do in two, 300 people on the same battery of tasks, so that we've actually got the assessment with percentiles of saying what the person's risk is for um, then um, you know, relapsing with respect to substance abuse or not doing terribly well and the um, standard interventions that we'd be working within. Um, but that's the data that we're going to need in order for it to be useful. I do actually think, if I, if I understood the comment correctly, it's a very unfortunate situation if we're only being able to say who's the risky individual are and not able to actually really help that risky individual. Um, we're actually going to have a horrible interim phase where we can identify the most disadvantaged individual with respect to what the prognosis is without necessarily having, we'll, we'll label up, we'll be able to identify the real problems that individual faces, but we'll know that that individual's problems don't get interacted with the current therapies that at least they're being offered. And so we're going to have to adapt what we do with that individual. So it's going to be a horrible interim phase, which is really going to be unpleasant for those individuals. So I don't know whether most people in uh, neuroethics or in this room know it, but there are um, algorithms out there for assessing the likelihood that a violent offender mm -hmm. upon release will recidivate, will commit the crime again. There are two of them. The one I remember is VRAG, which uh, uh, John Monahan at University of Virginia is involved in. And they claim you know, about 62% accuracy, 59, 60, depends in part on how you measure it. But the area under the receiver operating curve is pretty good. Um, I think they also have ends of tens of thousands, uh, basically record looking. They're, they're not looking at individual assessments of people, but at their demographic histories, their criminal histories, et cetera. It's easy to do a big N when you don't actually have to get new information directly from somebody. I think the interesting question will be how and whether we can show that neuroscientific methods can improve that accuracy. You start with VRAG, you add a brain scan, or you add an EEG, or you add something else and see if you can move it from 62% to 68%, or 65%, or 74%, recognizing you're never going to get it to 99%, or even probably 89%. And that's, that's where I think the future of that most likely lies. So I would say I'm not totally sure that's the case. Yeah. I mean, I think that would be a good thing if you can do it. But to be honest, I think uh, my my... I'm, I would be just as happy, even if it didn't actually get any better, mm. if it gave you a much more individualized picture about what the individual was struggling with so that you could then address those issues. Mm -hmm. Are you indeed? I mean, the fact right. is you're never. The problem is you can address all these issues. It's not, you know, I, I can't remember which, you know, there's always going to be some individual that does something unfortunate. Because, again, the problem is a lot of antisocial behavior is not because there's something wrong, but right. because it is the best idea at the time just in the, within the context of that individual's existence. And so it's, you know, we're never going to get, you know, we're not going to get rid of antisocial behavior. Any of us in this room could engage in antisocial behavior if the reward yeah. was sufficient yeah. and if the punishment wasn't. So by the way, I wouldn't steal the pointer. You wouldn't for $100 wouldn't. million? Dollars? No. Well, he's unhealthy. Yeah. We should study him. <laughs> OK, we're going to move on. <laughs> Um, Stephanie Bird, Science and Engineering Ethics. So uh, just to add a bit of information uh, first, and that is that uh, you may, I guess, don't know that in Massachusetts right now there is an ongoing case with respect to transgender um, surgery and um, maintenance uh, for somebody who was convicted of murder and then uh, changed gender after conviction. So that is an ongoing question. I'm not sure exactly where it stands now, but I know it's been raised and appealed and 
I, I think part of my brain may have known that, but didn't tell the rest of it, because I think that's why I said it may be in litigation now. I think I probably, yeah. it's probably the Massachusetts case that. Okay, yeah. let's go to, there. we got right. five And my minutes. question is, um, just tying in both the point you raised earlier, Hank, and that you raised, Jim, and you, I'm sure all, each of you can comment on this, and that is the issue around communication. Um, I'm thinking about the question of the responsibility of, ne of <laughs> neuroscientists as the, neuro and the neuroscience community and, and neuroethicists as a group to, in fact, be more um, proactive in highlighting things that are problematic, like the point that you made, Hank, which I thought was excellent about the fact that solitary confinement Sorry. causes mental illness, and the point that you made, Jim, about that we know that there are things that work. And so why aren't we more proactive in pushing that forward? And so like let me actually refer you, I, I can answer that very quickly. I'm gonna refer you to a paper that was then sort of adapted into a chapter written by Eric Rastin, Don DeRusso, and Judy Illis that looked at reporting of neuroscientific and neurotechnological advances in a variety of media. And the conclusion of that was very simple. It said it just spoke to the need for increased clarity in that level of communication not only in terms of positive outcomes, but what the problem space is. Because what tends to happen is, as you saw earlier, the allusion to neurohype, or what Roger Scruton refers to as neuro nonsense. I'm sure there's almost everyone in this room, that's something that they all impugn. No one is looking to advocate that. And the whole idea that there may be some tail wagging the dog or some show dogging that's going on, I think that is ant really antithetic to the entire neuroethics community. There's an obligation for frank, clear, pragmatically sound communication and its use, its prudent use. And the only way to do that is to make sure that that is an agenda item. So I think that, that Illis Racine and Durousseau made this point very, very well a number of years ago. And I think it's one that needs to be, it's like voting here in Chicago, early and often. So I think that the idea yeah, of making this point, yeah, and making this point ongoing is something that is gonna become ever more important as the sophistication and complexity of the science not only increases, but as it, its reach into various aspects of different contextual populations increases as well. So your point is well taken. It's a valid question, and I think the answer is sort of looming there. It's a question of readdressing that question repeatedly. I agree with him. <laughs> so me let me just say something about it, which is, first of all, the act of communicating to the public is not the same as the act of communicating to us. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it is an acquired skill, and we don't actually want every scientist or every <laughs> neuroethicist out there in public communicating to the public. In fact, God forbid. Uh, right? The second but is depends if on you've how listened, well they articulate, but yes. Perhaps. Uh, the, the second point that I would make is that if you listen, to, and this is serious, if you listen to the conversations we've had today, there have been a whole lot more questions posed than there have been answers uh, offered. And so, there are many sub-issues that arise from that, if I may. One of them is who's the decider, ultimately. That is, to whom are, are you posing these questions when we pose the questions? Who's going to decide them? And how, how are they going to be decided? And then how are they going to be implemented? So although I, those of you who know me, know I'm tremendously in favor of public communication about science, scientific issues, and societal science issues, it has to be done with some care and some grace, or we will mislead the public mm -hmm. terribly. And some of the conversation we've had sort of undoes that misinformation. I mean, if you think back to the, the three presentations, they spoke a lot about ambiguity. They spoke a lot about uncertainty. That we rarely hear portrayed out to the public. So I'm just offering a little caution. Mm -hmm. I Barbara. think context is everything. Thank you. Barbara Sahakian, University Can you of pull that down? Barbara Sahakian, University of Cambridge. So I'd like to focus and, and ask a question about the sort of juvenile and, and, and young person's um, uh, criminal behavior and that sort of thing. And I'd like to point out that um, 
as we know, 75% of mental illnesses start before the age of 24 years. And we also know that it, uh, for certain mental health disorders, like obsessive compulsive disorders, it's about 11 years to diagnosis. So first of all, we do know that some things work. Um, I don't think we're applying them early enough. We're not detecting uh, mental health disorders and applying them early enough, and we, we have to do that. But what I would like you to reflect on and, and, and answer a question for me about is how do you see within this um, population that we're talking about, you know, the, the, lack of, the lack of really good education, cognitive reserve, resilience, and how that will impact on them in a lifelong way? So let me start very, very quickly and then hand off to Hank and then hand over to Dr. Blair as well. So earlier in the day, we heard a lightning lecture from a woman who was my postdoc, Dr. Karen herrera Fara, And one of the things that she was advocating is the identification and postulation of recurrent violent behavior in youths as a psychiatric classifier, irrespective of whatever situation that occurs. And of course, she went down the rabbit hole into that and discussed it in detail, and she's here if you'd, if you'd like to speak with her. And I think it's important because one of the points that she's getting at in a paper that we have currently right now in revision for Acta Psychopathologica is just the points that you brought up. The idea that yes, you have a whole host of concomitant factors that may create this crucible effect for what may then become durable criminal type behavior. And if we could assess and or perhaps intervene early enough, it's a thorny issue, certainly, but I think that it's an issue that needs to be posed and articulated and navigated very, very, very prudently and rigorously. The question then becomes, what is sort of the, the minimum thing that we can do to be able to exert the best effect, if you will, a Rawlsian minimax? And it's a difficult balance to try to achieve because it does tend to bear that not only claiming potential blaming that goes along with it, other than the fact that this may be a diagnosis that's then able to say this has now had full recuperation and therefore the diagnosis can be removed, if in fact that's the issue. However, it's, it's thorny in a variety of other things because these things then amplify. So I think the issue you raise is an important one, one that needs to be addressed given from what we know about neuroscience and also just patterns of potential criminality. Number two, it's a social issue as well as a medical one, certainly a legal one. And number three, that intersection of the social and medical legal issues create a much larger and thornier set of issues that would need to be dissected. You don't want to sort of untangle the Gordian knot of the brain only to open a can of worms in terms of what you've got. And that, that's become a real problem for us. Untangle the Gordian knot to open a can of worms. <laughs> Over to you, Hank. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to picture using an untangled knot as a can opener. Um, so I think it's a really good question, and I'm actually involved in a project looking at what we're calling neuroprediction and the ethical, legal, and social implications of it. To some extent, you're talking about early diagnosis, but it may be easier to diagnose people if you've got them on a watch list because they're predicted to be at particularly high risk. So there are people who get classified as prodromal for schizophrenia, and it's thought that about 20% of those go on to a schizophrenic diagnosis. You could, if you um, pr found enough of the population that you predicted was in that 20 percent, you could intervene early and maybe help. You also have lots of um, potential negative social consequences for those who are identified as prodromal. Uh, and it, you know, it gets, I suppose, better if you move from 20 percent to 90 percent or 95 percent, but there are going to be tricky trade-offs. Okay, Dr. Blair, you want the last word? Yeah, so I think that it's, yeah, it's an extremely difficult one to, to do it in a prodromal case. Um, it's much easier to see when you're actually getting a symptom set um, um, being displayed because indeed there's motivation by at least a large chunk of individuals to get to, to re reduce the symptom set. So um, I, you know, I, I, I think under those circumstances it, it becomes, you know, the, at least for those individuals who want to change, it becomes a, a highly easy it's not, you don't have the ethical worries that you're having um, with the prodromal cases. With respect to some of the... many. Well, yeah, but, but, well, you know, anyway. But the, um, the, with respect to the sort of cognitive reserve and the emotional regulation issues as such, I'm not sure how many of those are really actually directly related to, I mean, they're clearly risk factors for mental illness generally. How much of those are um, risk factors for the 
antisocial behavior at the brain level as opposed to risk factors for antisocial behavior at the motivation level, uh, particularly with respect to cognitive resources, is not so clear to me. The fact is, if you are less, you've got less cognitive resources, your options available for making money are significantly reduced and for any other achieving your goals are significantly reduced. And therefore, your set of options, which is antisocial behavior is one of them, you're, you're getting, you, you know, antisocial become, becomes a higher percentage of the available options available to make your goals. So it's not clear to me, at least, with cognitive resource, that that's actually a particularly big factor with respect to the mechanisms that we see here, other than putting stress, you know, obviously if, you're, if, the, if, the, if there is an IQ issue, some, especially some of the cognitive control systems, the response control systems, may be more compromised the degree to which the individual's IQ is um, uh, reduced, if that was at all answering your question. So, thank you. Um, <laughs> let's thank, this is a great panel and a great discussion. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah.